Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, I am very excited to have a special guest with me. I have Dave Ryman from Cargill's Market Sense program, and you are a market analyst. That's right. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. I am so excited to have you. (laughs) I'm happy to be here. So before we dive into all the extra great stuff that you have to share with our audience, can you tell me a little bit, myself and the audience, a little bit about you and your background. And I really want to bring that in because I know you have such a great background (laughs) in this and you're so you're so bashful about it. You have such a great background in the industry and when we're going to be speaking Mm -hmm. about grain marketing in uncertain times, Mm -hmm. I want the audience to know your depth of experience experience so okay take it away sure so I grew up in a small town called Beausager just outside of Winnipeg Uh, I didn't actually come from a farm my folks actually ran a construction business Uh, but um, uh, at the time I guess I had some relatives that farmed and a lot of the kids I went to school with came from the farm and and uh, and continued to farm back uh, very early in my life I got into the grain industry and I over the years I worked for uh, various uh, grain companies uh, an oilseed crusher uh, commission house or so retail brokerage. Uh, I worked uh, for a while as a, an independent trader on the commodity exchange. Oh. Um, I spent a lot of time as, uh, as a consultant in an economics research firm okay. and then finally came to Cargill a few years back. Um, I guess that's one thing that I, I really found through the whole career was that most of that was involved with futures and options trade or market analysis. Um, in that time and working with you know food processors and investment banks and and uh, commodity funds and grain companies, uh, you know, overseas importers of our products. You see so many uh, different angles to the business and how people work the markets and and uh, and conduct themselves. You really couldn't help but learn a lot from it. Yeah. So as I, as I got older and I got into various positions where I started working with farmers uh, to try and help them with their farm marketing, I couldn't help but thinking back to many of the experiences I'd had earlier in life where I saw people really struggle with marketing. And over my career, I've seen where many people made, uh, I'll, I hate to use the word mistakes, but but made some classic sort of errors in the way they marketed their grain. You know, for instance, waiting till harvest and only marketing after that and traditionally leaving a lot of money on the table. So for me, it was a big motivation to take all of the things I'd learned and it's now been 40 years for me in this business. Um, 40 years is a long time to make a lot of mistakes and, and, and learn from, from what you've done. Uh, it was a big mission of mine to try to give something back I and it. so I, I really uh, I like to say I'm, I'm 10 years into a five-year retirement plan here at Cargill um, I really like the product line because it is a way to give back and to help farmers with the marketing that's both for financial purposes but also all of the stress and, and the anxiety that comes from marketing uh, especially in uncertain times um, you know if there, there are ways to manage that and so uh, my big mission is to try to help people with that What's so satisfying for me is that, you know, the more we help farmers and the better we get with that, actually Cargill does better as well. So it's kind of a nice win-win situation. So I love right, it. here I am. And that is why we have you and your wisdom on this show. <laughs> to me, and I know we're going to go into this a little bit later, but I, it's worth touching on. Mm-hmm. I speak to a lot of farmers and chat with them about how they market their grain. Yep. And I speak with advisors and I know there's room for improvement. Improvements. Yes. And on our show, and again, um, I'll mention that a little bit later, but as my audience knows, yeah. my goal is to bring the people mm-hmm. and ideas yeah. that will impact the farmers and their farming operation. Right. And from what I hear, we have a lot of room for improvement mm-hmm. on marketing our grain for maximum revenue. Right. So that is why I'm really excited to have you here. Yeah. Learn from the best. I'm also excited to be here. So good, <laughs> good. So, 
we sat down and we were trying to come up with the title for this episode and we landed on marketing green in uncertain times right and my goodness anybody we are we are in uncertain times yeah I, I think it's actually a fairly common theme for a lot of the uh, the uh, topics that I get to cover these days and it is uh, you know for farmers marketing is always uncertain because right. uh, the biggest issue that drives commodity markets uh, agricultural markets is the weather um, you basically stick all kinds of money in the ground every spring and hope that uh, adequate rain and sun and everything comes up or like last fall that it doesn't snow too early or anything it's a huge amount of uncertainty already but then you throw in situations like we've seen in the last year or two with trade wars and and disputes with uh, key buyers um, you know for lack of a better phrase a president that can govern the market with tweets from one minute to the next that maybe don't even jive um, <laughs> I've seen levels of uncertainty come into markets that I've never experienced in all my years it um, just seems and I know going back we've always said it's uncertain times mm -hmm. it is it's farming but yeah. I can't help but think this is a little extra uncertain yeah I, as I say it's not just the traditional weather issues yeah. and such that you would have had uh, now politics plays such a huge role uh, who we're getting along with or who we're not and what what I see is that for the farmer um, it's particularly upsetting because they control none of that right but right? they can't control the weather they can't control the what how the politicians are getting along uh, who's mad at who um, various issues that happen and so it must feel very uh, intimidating to try to market grain in the middle of all of that and it, yet it has such an important impact on your life absolutely I was just um, really quick at a producer meeting mm -hmm. and I know farmers are frustrated because they feel like agriculture is being used as a pawn right we're being forgotten about so yeah. coming back to what we're doing here I love that you're here because we're going to talk about some ways to market mm -hmm. some programs that can help put a little bit more of a little more certainty right into their marketing plans right there's ways of doing it because what you want to try to avoid and you know when people find out that I've been around the markets forever the first question they always ask me is you know well where's canola gonna go or what's gonna happen in wheat and uh, the truth is I can say something there but the truth is that I don't actually know yeah uh, we, you know we don't know if it's gonna rain in Iowa this July uh, we don't know how the crop in Monte Grosso in, in South America is gonna turn out in February when it's very important to timing for pod filling on soybeans uh, we don't know when the trade dispute with China will go away so you know we could make assumptions but the the big trick is and I guess where we try to come from as far as market sense and how we try to align our farmers is um, how can you position yourself so that you win if the market goes up and you win if the market goes down Excellent. and there are ways of doing that okay that's great so we know it's uncertain times I want to have your thoughts on some of the individual commodities okay. corn soybeans etc etc to I just want a little bit of your commentary to yep. see where we're at now how we got where we are right. and anything else you want to share commodity by commodity okay so um, you know running through some of the major stuff wheat it has been in a global glut for quite a number of years it's uh, we're seeing surplus supplies around the world World at levels that we haven't seen forever and it seems that even though acreage in this crop keeps going down yields and and uh, and production levels keep rising uh, so what the problem is with weed at this point is that there is a big surplus and it's not necessarily just in Canada okay. uh, it is elsewhere so as soon as one there you know we've seen a problem in Australia this year with wheat um, with wheat production but there's so many other countries that can make up the difference at this point uh, primarily Black Sea and, and other sellers so it has it has limited ability to really lift the market okay. um, same thing with canola you know we, we've come into a, the biggest surplus of canola that we've seen in history in Canada in the last 12 months and we have another decent crop of course uh, the the uh, a lot of the crop is out in the field still so there is a, a problem with that but it is still a surplus supply in a situation with a heavy soybean supply and so here again even though the market hasn't really collapsed it's also struggling to get back to levels it was a year ago uh, because uh, this this big supply and global supplies around okay. so there's been a few 
like that. Corn in Canada is actually quite tight, uh, but corn in the U.S. is not. So we see a situation where corn bids in theory could rise, uh, but we don't have a lot of export demand for our corn and um, it's basically priced itself out of rations for a lot of the feed livestock sector. Okay. So it doesn't really rally as much as it could. Um, and that's kind of a theme across many of the feed grains. You know, we, we've just come off a very, very tight carryout in oats and barley. Um, that's helped support those markets. Uh, but once again, globally, the barley production has actually increased quite significantly this year. So it's going to make it challenging in the year going forward to, to really get a, a significant rally on barley because other sellers are back in the market now. So, okay. you know, we can kind of go around the horn, but that's kind of a common theme is, is globally, there's not a lot of extremely tight supplies in most of these markets at this point. Okay. Excellent. And when I hear you saying that, marketing the grain, mm -hmm. definitely, that's ringing in my mind, right? Yep. Yep. If, if prices aren't going to be strong, mm -hmm. how can we as an individual producer make sure that we get the most for exactly. our harvest, What right? you re definitely don't want to do is leave any revenue on the table if you can avoid it. And, uh, you know, some of the best opportunities there are in creating what we call minimum price strategies. Okay. So there's good ways to do that, uh, that uh, if there is a drought somewhere this coming growing season and the market start to take off, you can participate in that rally. Uh, if, if the great conditions continue and the market starts to sag further, at least we don't take further losses we protect and, and at least live to fight another day, sort of. Okay, excellent. Before we go into some of uh, the strategies, mm -hmm. I want to, I was going to get you to put your wizard cap on. Yeah. You follow the markets all the time. You know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know how we got here. You know what is happening globally. Yep. What do you think we are up against mm -hmm. for 2021 and in terms of uh, the factors mm -hmm. that affect the market and our prices? Yep. Put that wizard cap on and tell us what's going to happen. So, and, and this is the, the one key trick is I, I like to say I'm not a fortune teller, so I guess oh, come I'm on. Not, a, not a wizard either. Uh, because again, there are so many unknowns, but I do think that left to themselves, uh, we are probably in an oversupply situation on oil seeds. Uh, we're in maybe a oversupply situation on wheat. And, um, you know, we have uh, tr problems with exporting outcomes. So, uh, you know, again, it almost comes down to praying for a drought or something. Of course, you oh. uh, wish it somewhere else. No, no, and, thank and, you. And, yeah, that's not, <laughs> not, good, not that's, at home. And that's not a yeah. good marketing plan, right? Uh, you know, so I think that that's once again one of the ways that we differentiate from trying to be the wizard is try, try not to predict that outcome, but rather say, is this a good floor price? And this is something that market sense advisors do a lot of is it's not just my research on the market um, and then it's a, a recommendation that comes out. It's, it comes down to the advisor sitting at the kitchen table with the farmer looking directly at their cost of production, what their cash flow needs are, uh, what do they need to do to survive on that farm and, and hopefully thrive on that farm. If there is a good floor price there, can we protect it? Okay. And even if the farmer wants to be bullish and hope that the prices rally or, uh, you know, maybe there is going to be a drought in Kansas this year that will help the wheat market, you know, how, what can we do to position so that they can satisfy those cash flow needs, uh, cover the bin space and still participate in that rally. So that takes away the need to be the wizard. I don't, I, okay. I often say like I have the coolest job in, in market analysis in Canada because I don't have to be right. It doesn't matter what I think about the market. Um, it doesn't matter if you believe me about the market. If you position yourself, you'll win anyway. And I think that that, uh, it makes my life actually quite easy because I don't have to, I, I, I obviously look at, uh, at market direction and I think I know where things are going and we talk about that with the customers. But at the same time, it, um, it doesn't require that I'm actually right or that you buy into my story. If, if, uh, if you, again, you know, an example might be uh, something you, you have a, a, an idea on the value of your home, uh, you think the market's going to rise, but you buy insurance at some base level anyway, just in case it burns down. And, and I think that's sort of how we look at life here is what, it, what do you need to cover as a basic minimum on that home? So if the worst happens, you'll be able to rebuild and, and start over. Um, but 
but at the same time still allow for the market to rise if it does happen, right? So that, that's, seems, uh, that takes a lot of heat off of me having to be the wizard. Right? Yeah, and that seems like the best of both worlds. And yeah. I think that's a good shoe in to the next mm-hmm. item that I want to speak to you about. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.